Hello, everyone, and welcome to the May 2018 community meeting of the ITB2 Transmark Foundation. My name is Rudy Potenzone, and I will uh, be the moderator for today. As usual, we will record this session, and the slide deck will be made available on our website within a day. Recordings are also all available on our YouTube channel. You can see here the agenda for today. We'll quickly go over about the, the updates on the board. Um, election that's underway. Um, just announced that the I2B to 1.7.10 is released. Uh, a little bit uh, of more updates on our June and fall meetings that are coming up. And then a very exciting announcement from Partners Healthcare on a data challenge. So with that, let me introduce Diane Key, our Executive Director. Diane? Thank you, Rudy, and um, welcome everyone. It's a it's a great to have you join. Um, this is a, a busy time of year. We uh, we're gearing up for um, the, the meeting in in uh, at Harvard. We have a board election coming up. We've got you know I two B two releases going on. So a lot of stuff going on um, this time of the year. Um, so very excited. So Rudy, go to the next slide. I just want to remind people that. Um, our board election is um, underway right now. Um, jump to the next slide, Rudy. I'll, I think that explains it better. So our board um, is nominated by our members, um, and that happens every spring. Um, I want to remind people that um, new members can be nominated in the fall. So um, that process will, will happen. Um, next slide, Rudy. This show, okay, here is a list of our current uh, board of directors. Uh, five uh, seats will be replaced. Um, two, two of the um, uh, directors are uh, nominated again, uh, part of the nomination for the next term. So next slide. Okay, so here's where we are. We're in the middle of um, election week. So if you're a member um, and you received the email um, regarding the election, please um, vote. You can vote for up to five um, open seats. Um, and we will be announcing the, um, the new uh, uh, board um, next Tuesday. And and uh, and the board and the board meeting is is uh, following the um, first day of the June meeting. Um, the I two B two one dot seven dot ten release um, a notice will go out today, so that is um, that's exciting. Um, uh, hopefully, I'll get that out uh, right after this call. Um, we also have an I two B two Transmart release um, eighteen dot one that is um, uh, will be released uh, shortly as well. So a lot going on um, on the foundation side. So Rudy, I'll let you take it for the Geneva um, and Harvard meeting. Okay, thanks, thanks, Dan. <clears throat> so uh, our, Geneva, our June meeting is, is well underway, our uh, planning. Um, it's two days at Harvard Medical School. Uh, the first day we've got a very powerful collection of speakers uh, talking on a number of topics. Uh, I'll show you in a second. And the second day is then a set of workshops uh, that I think will be uh, very interesting. Um, we do have a poster session scheduled, but I, no one has submitted any posters at this point. So uh, that session is obviously wide open. If we don't get a couple of posters, we will cancel if we have to. But I encourage you, if you'd like to have a poster up, we have that. Uh, it'll, the posters will be up um, and available for people to read and, and see during the meeting. And so if you have a poster, uh, please go to the website and uh, submit your, uh, your proposal. Uh, this is uh, some of the, the keynote speakers uh, that are talking uh, on the first day. Of course, Zach uh, introducing and um, giving his perspective on kind of where we are um, with uh, both the foundation and just generally precision medicine. Um, and then some some really you know forward thinking talks by George Church, John Lamka, Eric Prexlis, uh, Paul will um, talk about uh, the new I2B2 Transmart release that's coming. Uh, Sean, uh, about some of the exciting things coming in I2B2. And then uh, we have Becky Steck from University of Michigan talking about their very um, broad program at Michigan uh, in terms of using the, the platforms and the types of research that they're doing. So, and a couple of others as well. So it's a very 
um, solid day, I think, of some really interesting talks. The second day, uh, we have a couple of concurrent sessions, some of the working groups of the foundation going over ETL, ontologies, user interfaces, et cetera, uh, will meet uh, face-to-face if possible, and they'll be there. And then also a couple of special interest groups on you know, just software and open source software and scalable genomics, a few other things. Um, there will be a, a, an ACT session, um, accrual for clinical trials. Uh, this is the shrine, the next level. And they'll have their, they're putting together an agenda that we'll make public shortly uh, on you know their discussion um, topics. And then um, Paul VX group um, will um, be uh, assembling for an entire day on the I2B2 Transmart Foundation, uh, during which they'll, they'll go over some of the technical aspects of the platform, uh, give a demo, I'm sure, uh, talk about the installation, and then have an open discussion. So uh, it really looks like a very solid uh, two days of, of activities. Uh, we're also excited to announce we have several sponsors already signed up. Uh, of course, strong support from the DBMI, uh, Axiomatics, Trinetics, and Google for Education have all now joined us and will be sponsoring the meeting. Uh, and so we're uh, very happy to have them. Their support uh, makes uh, being do, doing events like this possible. So again, we thank them for their support. Um, Meeting logistics, uh, it's going to take place at Harvard Medical School. Um, the first day is going to be in the same place it's been the last couple of years. And then day two, we'll move across the street uh, around the uh, rooms around the Countway Library. Uh, registration's open. We have over 150 people registered already. Uh, we are just one month away. So if you are interested in coming, please register soon. Uh, poster submissions are open. Uh, there's still, I think there's still some rooms at the hotel. So if you want to, to stay, you're staying in the area. Uh, and then um, please register for the event. So that's the, the Harvard meeting. Uh, we also have announced that the fall users group meeting will be uh, in uh, Campus Biotech in Geneva, Switzerland on October 31st and November 1st. We're in the process now of soliciting um, speakers for the event. So there is if you check the website, you can submit a uh, proposal for uh, speaking at the meeting. Uh, and also, uh, as of this morning, I've now opened up registration. So you can go, again, from the website or the link here, you can go and register for that meeting. So uh, we're, we're hoping that uh, this is also a really well-attended meeting. It was last year. Over 150 people attended this, and um, we're expecting a larger crowd this year. So... Again, you know, keep your eye on the website. Uh, as the program starts to fill up, we will show you um, what uh, who's speaking and what types of, you know, all the various topics that we'll be uh, covering at that meeting. So that's all. That's what we had for these um, uh, for about the meetings. And now I'm going to turn the, the program over to Sean Murphy and Mike Mendez. They're going to talk about a very exciting announcement uh, from Partners. Sean. Great. Well, thank you so much, Rudy, and um, uh, lots of exciting stuff happening. The, um, the thing that I wanted to talk about is a Partners Healthcare Biobank Disease Challenge, which we're having, which encompasses some of the um, phenotype algorithms that people have developed um, either in I2B2 or, you know, as part of their work. Um, on, on um, various platforms in, or in various networks, um, kind of converging on um, the posting of this using um, patients, uh, real patients in the biobank. Um, we've made the data into a, a limited data set, which is structured all, you know, it's, it's coded data. And that data from uh, 83,000 patients will um, be available to develop um, and, and exercise uh, phenotypes. And so, as many of you know, um, the data from the electronic medical record uh, can be pretty dirty. Um, it's a great place to start in terms of understanding what diseases that a patient has, but the fact is that normally in, in, in many coded diseases like diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, um, 
somewhere between um, 40 and 60% and, and, uh, of the disease, uh, people who are coded for having those in ICD-9 codes actually do not have the disease, uh, meaning that, um, you know, if you're taking all comers who have ICD-9 codes for rheumatoid arthritis or not, uh, for example, then, um, you know, you actually have about a 40% uh, chance of actually having rheumatoid arthritis and a 60% chance of not having rheumatoid arthritis, which is pretty bad in terms of like trying to do science, right? So if you're trying to do something like we do on the biobank and figure out, well, what new kinds of genetic markers are associated with a disease, if uh, 40, uh, 60 percent of your patients are mislabeled with the disease, then your analysis is going to pretty much yield nothing, right? It's going to be a bum analysis. So in order to improve that, um, algorithms have been developed, you know, that help us um, derive the truth. And the way that we are kind of positioning this competition is that all the algorithms that have been developed throughout you know, this community and other communities and throughout many of the, of the um, scientists that work in this field can uh, participate in a challenge. So the challenge is that we know, because we've done chart review on some of the, of, of the phenotypes, what they actually, what diseases they have. But coming into the biobank, you've got all the data, but you don't have the actual 40%, for example, that truly have the disease and you have to figure it out. And, you know, you can imagine ways that you could approach this, right? I mean, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, um, you don't just rely on a code, right? You might have, look for other kinds of um, medications that somebody with rheumatoid arthritis would be on, or, you know, what kind of lab tests might reveal that they have rheumatoid arthritis, like a rheumatoid factor or something of that nature. And, um, and they can go by things like how many codes do they have and so forth for rheumatoid arthritis or what span of time. So there's lots of clues in the medical record that you can use to your advantage to derive the actual disease that these patients have, but, um, but you've got to figure it out, right? And people who do work in this, like many of you do, are, you know, have really gotten very sophisticated in terms of understanding how this can be done. So in order to kind of, of get this all together and experiment with how we could do it on what really turns out to be a preview of this um, platform that we're developing in I2B2 with, with uh, uh, um, putting a relational system like I2B2 together with a data lake system. And how do you get data from uh, doing queries for cohorts into a computational environment? Um, where you have uh, Python and R as your computational tools, wow. uh, the, the extensive um, libraries that are associated with those uh, in order to do machine learning and so forth. And that, um, and it's actually the exposure to that new environment that's being developed where we can get very large blocks of data out of I2B2 and into this uh, data lake that you actually can uh, see in this new uh, challenge environment. Of course, the other aspect of this challenge environment is that it needs to be very tight, right? It's a data enclave because the idea is that in the future, you know, people could host data like this. You could invite data scientists, but you don't want that data to leak out of your environment. So um, we've been building this with uh, uh, Dell um, EMC in order to put together an airtight environment to host the data. And the main architect of that has been uh, Mike Mendes. Yes, that's right, our own Mike Mendes. And uh, Mike, uh, do you wanna describe the environment a little bit? I think we need to unmute him. Okay, I'll, get, I'll take care of that. Mike, if you're talking, we can't hear what you're saying because you're muted, so hang on for a little bit. Okay, Mike, you should be unmuted. Okay, great. Can uh, you yes. hear me? Sounds good. Yep. Okay, so the 
architecture of the system, so because um, it does ha it's a limited data set, we have everything in a DMZ. So we, have, we created a virtual uh, DMZ so that anyone who connects up won't be able to access any of the internal partners network, but they'll be able to access their own stuff. Um, and then we also want it, we're concerned uh, about people being able to like copy the data from the DMZ and bring it back to their own, whether it is just to manipulate it or other, other things. But we were like, the data has to stay within the DMZ. So we utilize an application from uh, Verizon, from uh, VMware, uh, Dell EMC, called Horizon. And Horizon is very similar to Citrix, if you're familiar with Citrix. And so that allowed us to create an environment that people could connect up to using uh, either a web-based application or an application that runs on Linux or Windows. And that, that would limit them from being able to copy and paste the data. It would also limit them from like transferring files back and forth. I mean, you, you're, you can set it up to do that, but we restricted it. And so, so when they connect up, they're going to be presented with a Ubuntu VM. So each, uh, each of the teams is going to be allocated, uh, I think it's one, ter one terabyte of hard drive space, uh, 96 gigs of RAM, um, and there can be up to four uh, participants. And because this is all done on the, the V block of uh, VMware, we, cr we created groups of uh, connection pools so that your group would be allocated 96 uh, a gig of RAM. But when you like when you're in the Ubuntu, you, you if you do a top, you'll see each of them had 96 gigs of RAM. So it's not four times 96; it's really one shared block of 96. So if one person was using all of the 96 gigs of RAM, the other people, they would still be able to do stuff, but it would be basically swapping a hard drive in order to, for them to get their work done, and it would be very slow for them. So, so that's how we're limiting uh, the usage. Uh, also on these Ubuntu machines, um, they, uh, they'll connect up to an I2B2 instance. They can run a query and then extract the data from that using a plugin that Nish Ranasan uh, and his team developed for the biobank. Uh, so it would connect up to the, uh, it would basically extract the data from the SQL Server database and uh, place it on their desktop as CSV files. Then they can either use uh, RStudio or Python to manipulate the data and then work on their project in their algorithms. So. Great point, yeah. Yeah, so I think if there anything else, but I think that's basically it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll entertain any questions too, Mike. So, so um, yeah, that's great. That's a great explanation. Um, so the, um, if we go to the next slide, we see some of the logistics of the data challenge. So um, we're going to, uh, Everything uh, can be seen by going to uh, www.partners.org slash biobank challenge, right? So www.partners.org slash biobank challenge. And we'll send more of these materials out through emails. The only problem is that, so all this of course had to be IRB reviewed and you know how when you get into IRB land, everything has to be reviewed. So we still have to get some emails reviewed by the, by the, bio, by the, uh, IRB before we can send them out, but this poster is is approved by the IRB, so there you go. <laughs> so we can so we can show this. So um, so that so so just uh, uh, if you go to the URL www.partners.org/biobankchallenge, you'll be able to register, and you can see that registration is from April 23rd through June 29th. So it's actually after the conference on purpose, right? So that but. You'll see if you go to look for registration, you're going to have to get a sign off from a signatory at your institution because of data use agreement. So, um, so you're going to want some 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 time to do that. So, so, so keep that in mind. After you get registered, 
And remember, so, and, and the way it's going to work is that 50 teams, 5-0, 50 teams are going to be able to register, right? And so, um, each team can be up to four members. And that's what Mike was talking about in that, and the way the four members on the team utilize the resources is that, you know, that that's really just resource. Each team is going to get the same amount of resources. So if you have one member on your team or four members on your team, you get the same amount of memory and so forth for that team. So it's all done by team. And um, you'll have uh, before the competition starts, you'll have from July 2nd to the August 14th to do everything that Mike just talked about, you know, log on to the uh, onto the uh, data enclave, you know, look through it, see how, you know, the libraries are, ask for new libraries that you want that to go into R or, or Python, um, see how the whole bulk, bulk download. And by the way, Mike didn't um, give himself enough credit on that because yes, Mitch did the plugin to um, um, actually request the data, but Mike's the one who did the bulk download. So you can actually download tens of millions of records within minutes, right, Mike? Um, because, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, be, be because of this new bulk download. And this is actually what we're formulating for kind of a, a new age of linking the, you know, systems like I2B2 where you have access to a lot of data. You do some preliminary queries, you figure out the cohort and the data you want, and then you can in a in a really big data way, download it onto a data lake, and then do manipulations. You know, using using the kinds of um, materials that are available in a, in, a, in a data lake. And so that you can all look at between July second and August fourteenth. And that would be there won't be the real data on it. There there will be fake data that that Mike creates. And then from September twelfth through October tenth the competition opens up and the goal of the competition is um, if you go to the, 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 the website, you'll see it's both to get a good uh, accuracy in your determination of the phenotype, but also to show, to visualize how that was obtained, right? How the, how, how the accurate phenotype was obtained. Oops. Relog on to my thing. Okay, how that was obtained. So there's both a uh, there's both a part of this which is you know very kind of you know mathematically rigorous and that we can determine you know from the number of patients that you identify who were correct and incorrect what the um, what the accuracy is or the area under the curve is of your determination for various phenotypes. But then there's also a visualization part, right, and a data stratification part where we want to understand, you know, how you can um, show us the method and, and how the method was successful and how, what, what factors went into the method of determining the phenotypes. There's kind of two parts to this. Now, why would you want to do all that? Well, one is it's just a cool platform and you might want to experiment on it, and that's great. But there's also some prizes. So first prize is $15,000. So $15,000 for first prize. And it doesn't end there, because second prize is $10,000, and third prize is $5,000. So there's some very significant prizes associated with this, um, with this challenge, which, um, which definitely makes it worth, worth people's while. So um, I think that's all I have. Uh, Mike, can you think of anything I, I forgot? Um, no, not that I can think of. Okay. And we can take any questions. Okay. So, uh, one question has come in from Gil, um, who's on our, uh, from, from Michigan. Uh, he's on our board as well. Uh, for part two of this challenge, will there be qualitative metrics for performance or just a large set of white papers or joint community publication? So, so there, there are qualitative metrics um, that uh, go into the um, determination. Um, and if you go to uh, biobank uh, www.partners.org slash biobank challenge, 
you'll be able to read this kind of with me because I'll just, I'm just gonna just um, uh, go into some specifics. The first one, so if you go down the page a little bit, it says the challenge, right? So part one is develop computed phenotypes for five diseases. And it's developing a machine learning algorithm to identify the five diseases um, with, an, with a ROC curve that can be calculated um, and scored. And then part two is novel insights from EHR data. So that means that you there's a qualitative determination of grouping patients perhaps into meaningful clusters, stratifying patients by disease severity, identifying longitudinal patterns of disease or care, identifying predictors or treatment initiation and of treatment initiation and response, that is, you know, getting with drugs, right? And that this is a subjective part. And this is this is not, this is this is going to be judged in 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 a way to um, that involves the scoring that you can just, if you scroll down a little bit further, you can see that um, we've got a kind of a, a, a point system where you've got algorithmic performance, which is 20 points, interpretation of the model, that's a qualitative and that's 10 points. And then the innovation and insights, which is both the design of the methods, which is five points, the innovation of the method, which is five points, the clinical importance, which is 10 points, and the clarity of results and visualizations, which is 10 points. So there's this, so the judging will be made on those um, criteria. Um, I, uh, let me oh, have you go. Oh, um, actually, oh, I, I misspoke and he was asking about the quantitative metrics, which I think you just answered. Gil, would you like to, uh, did that help that clarify or would you like to ask anything else? I, you should be unmuted. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. I I think this is a terrific uh, opportunity and good challenge. Um, there, is, um, there is always this question. That it sounds like there are categories of criteria, but it's really like judging posters or something like that. There's a, uh, a subjective score given for each of these categories. Is that right? That's correct, Gil. So what we expect is there's going to be a presentation in a Jupyter or a, a R notebook and that that presentation is what will be judged. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Gil. Uh, we have another question from um, Philip Reeder. Let me unmute you, Philip. Okay, Philip, you should be unmuted. Yeah, I was just wondering what the diseases were that people should be targeting on this, or if there was a list. That won't come out until the beginning of the challenge. Okay. Yep. Okay, any other questions? Okay, well, we, <clears throat> we will get this posted also on our website. And as more information comes, we'll have links uh, as appropriate. So, um, this sounds really great, Sean. I think everybody would be real excited as they learn about it. Yep, great. Okay. Diane, would you like to come back? Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, thanks, Sean and Mike. That actually is, is uh, really exciting. I'm, I'm uh, excited that you had the opportunity to talk about that. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, if there's anybody have any other general questions about the foundation or the meeting or anything else going on you want to bring up before I close? Anything you're interested in, anything you, if you want to volunteer to be on one of our um, working groups, that would be great. Certainly if, if you don't speak up here and you want to go to our website and leave an idea on our website, that would be great too. We um, will probably go ahead and cancel the June community call um, just because it's the week before the conference and I think people are um, going to be focusing on coming to the conference, hopefully, and um, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone. So no questions? Okay. Then we'll close for um, this month. And, oh. Yeah, Gil, Gil was, uh, had a question. 
uh, how many about how many people will come to the June meeting if there was a modest charge? Anybody have a response to that? I mean, you know, currently it's um, we have not charged for the conference. People could be, the easy way to do this is if you put put something in the chat window. We'd, we'd just like to hear some ideas about, you know, if there was a charge, would that be, um, would that change your your whether you attend or not? Again, we have over 150 people registered. Last year we were over 200, and uh, as we're a month away, uh, we're expecting to get up to the 200 mark again. Yeah, it looks like we have another question, maybe an answer. Everybody's muted. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the suggestions coming in back, say, it depends on how much, how modest it would be, um, it would certainly have an impact on the attendance. So yeah, so we are we are I am seeing all the, the comments coming in. Um, it looks like we, yeah. yeah, some so one person said fifty dollars would be, you know, would would work. Um, Over 200 would be a problem. Okay, but this, I mean, this is helpful. So, you know, modest. I mean, I, we're definitely thinking modest. We're not, um, why charge? Somebody wanted to know why charge. Um, you know, it's, it, we need, we, that would be money that would help us um, cover the cost of the food and the, um, the conference facility, facilities, um, which can be pricey. Okay, I mean, this is helpful. F free is always better. <laughs> Any other um, questions or, or comments from folks? No, I'm not seeing anything else. Okay, great. Well, great. Well, um, thanks everyone for joining us and um, hopefully we'll see you in, uh, in June.